You would turn in your Bibles this morning as we continue through our study of the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Our text for the day will be verses 20 through 24, uh, but we're going to go back and read verses 17 through 19 that have preceded this particular these particular verses, because of course it does give us context to what we're talking about today. So if you would please stand as we read these verses of Scripture together. Therefore this I say and testify in the Lord, that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind being darkened in their mind, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But you did not learn Christ in this way. If indeed you heard him and were taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, to lay aside in reference to your former conduct the old man, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and to be renewed in the spirit of your mind and to put on the new man, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. May God greatly bless his word today. You may be seated. So we have just finished, as we said last week, verses 17 through 19. And so there's a contrast here that is given. And so the Apostle Paul is going on to begin his contrast between the former way of life of the Ephesians and the new way of life they have as believers. And we've talked about this historically, how... Wicked, the city of Ephesus was. And I'm not going to go back all through that, but I do want to say that that is the contrast. We have the blackness and the darkness of sin pictured in the city of Ephesus. Their pagan idolatry, their sexual immorality, uh, many different things, as we said before, that even other pagans looked upon Ephesus as the very epicenter, the very blackness of vileness. Now in some of the versions that we have here in this particular first phrase here in verse 20, which is just a few words here, but you did not learn Christ in this way. And I hope many of you noticed that I put an emphasis upon that because in many of the translations, there's an exclamation point that is put there at the end of that verse. And that phrase, and the reason for that is that Paul is making a very bold statement here. He is stating this emphatically, and I think that it is appropriate that he does so. I think this is how that he means it to be understood. Paul's feelings are very strong in this point, as I believe ours should be as well, because it is the teaching of Christ and the writers of the New Testament that there should be an evident and a stark contrast between unbelievers and believers. People should not have to have a hard time figuring out whether you are a believer or not by the evidence of your life. The evidence should give clear contrast there that we are no longer darkness but we are light. That we no longer walk in unholiness but that we walk in holiness. And so when he says this here, you did not learn Christ this way, this means more than just learning about Christ. As someone has said, it is to embrace all that Christ is and to learn and be in agreement with his teaching. Spiro Zodiates, a Greek scholar, says really this phrase means Christ is the direct object here. He is presented as the subject matter and the sum and substance of this gospel. To become related to him is to know him and knowing him is to know his teaching and abide by it. The learning Christ that Paul is talking about here is not a really a 
progressive increase in knowledge. Now, we do believe that, which occur, but that does occur, and we are to have that in our study of Christ and the Scriptures. We do know that in 2 Peter 3 and 18, he teaches that we are to grow in the grace and the knowledge of, of Christ. We are to do that. But the Greek tense here speaks of a one-time action. In other words, it's in the errorist tense. So what he is talking about here is our initial regeneration, our initial being born again, our initial knowledge. So as believers in Christ, Paul is reminding the Ephesian church of this, that in their salvation, they learn of Christ. They know something of him initially in salvation are acquainted with him. We had this morning where Jesus in Matthew eleven twenty nine 29, as Josh read, read this, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. John 6 and 45 says it is written in the prophets and they shall all be taught by God. All, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. So we are imparted as being born again a new nature or desire for Christ, following Christ imitating Christ. And I believe that comes really in the very beginning stages of our salvation. There's a uniting with Christ and a knowledge of the nature of Christ and life in Christ that comes in salvation so that even baby Christians know the difference. They realize the difference in what they used to be and what they are now. You know, when you became a believer, nobody had to tell you, hey, I'm different now. Something's happened to me. My desires, my thought process, the way that I speak, the way that I act, I'm different now. I mean, what brought this about? It is this initial knowledge, this learning of Christ that comes in salvation. And so Paul is reminding them in verses 17 through 19, he reminds them basically of where you've been. He said, we basically said, none of you guys are innocent. If you remember, this is what you were before salvation. But you didn't learn Christ so that you could go back to what you used to be, is what he's about to say here. And so we learn that we are new in our salvation initially. We are not the same. And our, if our life looks the same after our profession of faith as it did prior to that, then guess what? We didn't learn Christ. We are not new. 1 John 1 and 6, he writes, If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, which is what Paul is talking about here, he's already showed us what the darkness is and how the darkness acts. We lie and do not do the truth. We don't do the truth if we are living in darkness and profess to be Christians. If we don't do the truth, I would say this. What John is saying is you don't have Christ. If you don't walk in the truth, if you don't walk in the light, you don't have Christ. So, if indeed then he says you have heard him and were taught in him just as truth is in Jesus. So Paul is asking the question then, did you indeed hear him? Have you heard him? Did you hear the voice of the shepherd? Have you heard the voice of the shepherd? Over in John chapter 10, the of course we know the chapter there where it is about I am the good shepherd, Jesus teaches there. And he gives some clear clarion verses there that speak of the sheep following the shepherd. In John 10, there in verse 3, to him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep, what? Hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and what do they do? He leads them out, and when he brings all his own out, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep, what? They follow him because they know his voice. They know his voice. Verse 16, and I have other sheep which are not from this fold. I must bring them also and they will hear my voice and they will become one flock with one shepherd. And then verses 26 and 27 down here, he says, but you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Now, I'm not saying we hear an actual voice like you hear my voice. 
let you hear the calling of Christ upon your heart and upon your life. There's a call, there's a drawing to Christ. And what is the evidence that you have heard the voice of the shepherd? It is that you are following the commands of the shepherd. That you are following the truth of the shepherd. That is the evidence. This is what he's saying. There's an effectual call. We believe in the effectual call of the shepherd. There's a general call, the gospel, that goes out to to everyone. But there's an effectual call of the shepherd upon The lost, and when someone follows that call and gives evidence, yes, I believe in Christ, I want to be a disciple in Christ, as we had a baptism here here just a couple of weeks ago. It is an evidence, it is a testimony. Yes, I love the shepherd, I want to follow the shepherd. There's an evidence there to that. You go back over to Matthew chapter 4, where... Jesus called some of these apostles, but they were, first, before they were apostles, they were just lost sheep. (laughs) And you go there to verses 18 through 21. And in that, it says, as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was also called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee their father, in mending their nets. And he called them and immediately left the boat and their father and followed him. And then a few chapters over in Matthew chapter 9. Jesus is walking along. It says he saw a man named Matthew. Sitting in the tax office, ooh, a tax collector. <laughs> and he said to him, follow me. You notice there, that's with emphasis there. It's a command. Follow me. And he stood up and he followed him. But this is the evidence that you are someone who is a true follower of Christ, is obedience to the call of Christ. And what Paul is talking about here, what we're going to get into here, is those that have heard his voice and hear his call and follow are those that are obedient to what the Word of God says. So the evidence is there that there is enough following and obedience to learning and hearing his call. And Paul speaks about here that those who heard him and were taught in him that they do so because the truth is in Jesus. The truth is in Jesus. God's people, the sheep, I believe this firmly, have a desire for the truth. They love the truth of the word of God. It is the pasture in which they love to feed. The green, lush grass of the pasture. That's what sheep like. And I'll say this. You know, historically, goats will eat anything. But sheep want green pasture. Sheep want the truth as far as spiritually speaking. In John 18 and 37, remember that Jesus told Peter, Feed my sheep. What was he talking about? He was telling them there, and in in John 14 and 6, you remember he says, I am the truth. He was telling Peter there, Teach them about me. The truth is in me. The truth is in Jesus. He said, teach them what you know about me and what I have taught you. And throughout the gospel of John, this Jesus is presented in the embodiment of the truth. Moses brought the law, but Jesus spoke of grace and truth in John, as we've already said, in John 3 and 21, we're familiar with John chapter 3, but it speaks there about those that desire the truth and want the truth. Jesus speaks there of those that, to Nicodemus, you must be born again. But in verse 21 of this, he says, He who practices the truth comes to the light, so that his deeds may be manifested as having been done by God. Followers of Christ practice the truth. They practice the truth. They come to the light who is the Lord Jesus Christ. This is who they want. This is who they desire. 
What is it that Jesus told the Samaritan woman? In John 4, 23 and 24, an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The true worshipers of God want truth. They want the truth of the word of God. Don't give me something else. I want truth. I want this truth. I desire this truth. If you go back to John chapter 8, there in verses 45 and 46, Jesus again teaching here says, Because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I speak truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears the words of God. For this reason you do not hear them because you are not of God. Why is it that people reject the truth of God? They're not people of God. We see such a stark contrast in this day and time. People don't want to believe that there is absolute truth. They reject absolute truth. They they, they want to basically say that my feelings are truth. Feelings are not truth. Emotions are not truth. The truth is that there is one Lord Jesus Christ and if you would have salvation, you must come to Him. And you must follow Him. And you must practice what the truth is and and who Jesus is. And this is what Paul is talking about here. There's one truth that saves the, as, as Paul talked about in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, he speaks of the truth and that he would have all men to be saved. And I believe that he wants men to be saved. But if you're going to be saved, there is this one truth, and this truth is in the Lord Jesus Christ, and there is one way of salvation. And the fact that that men have rebelled against the truth is not a new thing. If you look back on the day of Stephen's stoning, He preached the truth to the Jews and it said they screamed out and they wanted to cover their ears like a bunch of little kids and they rushed upon him and gnashed on him with with their teeth. They couldn't handle the truth. They wouldn't believe the truth. They didn't want the truth. But beloved, we must preach the truth of the word of God if there is ever a day in which it is needed. Now look back upon history and how we got the truth of this word and how many men died at the stake, were burned at the stake or sawn asunder or drawn and quartered because they printed the truth and they preached the truth and they proclaimed the truth. If they burn this building down around us, we must preach the truth. There's some in our day that are near the truth, but they haven't believed it yet. They have not embraced Christ by faith. I was thinking about this the other day. You know, sometimes I will listen to commentators or podcasts or whatever like that. Yeah, I know that surprises some of you because I'm technology challenged. I was listening to a thing last week, Ben Shapiro. Some of you are familiar with him. He's interviewing John MacArthur. And John MacArthur is basically preaching the gospel to him. And he seems like he knows a lot of truth. He's very, seems like near the truth, but he hadn't believed it. Because he rejects Christ as the Son of God. Let me say this. If you reject Jesus Christ, you're rejecting the truth. You know? Another guy I know of, Jordan Peterson, and he says a lot of good things, but he's not a Christian. He knows a lot of truth, but he doesn't know the truth that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And what Paul is saying, he's saying truth is, he says it right here, just as truth is in Jesus. If you miss Jesus, you miss the truth. You miss the truth. 
You reject the truth here also is what Paul is saying to reject Christ is to reject this truth. If you reject the truth that a new man in Christ is to be a changed man or woman, a transformed man, a man of holiness and righteousness, you're rejecting Christ and you're believing a different gospel. A gospel that does not hold to righteousness and holiness of life, not just spiritually speaking in salvation, but practically speaking is a different gospel than the gospel that Paul preached and John preached and most importantly that Jesus preached. So this is what Paul is talking about here. The truth is in Jesus. And so what does he mean here, the truth is in Jesus? Well, hyphen he says here, Here it is, to lay aside in reference to your former conduct the old man, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. Numero uno, lay aside the old man. In the New American Standard 2020 version, it's translated like this, that in reference to your former way of life, you are to rid yourselves of the old self. So first of all, Paul says to lay aside or cast off the old man, the former conduct of the old man. This phrase is used in other places. You look at Romans 12 and 32. Let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Lay those aside. Put them aside. You're not to be holding on to those. The next verse we'll get to in our study of Ephesians 4 here is Therefore, laying aside falsehood. And then Paul goes down here. Here are the things that we're to lay aside. But here he just makes a general statement to lay aside the old man. Here. So this is what he says. There is the expectation, I believe, in here, in the teaching of the New Testament, the writers expected believers to put aside their old sins, their old habits of sin. Now, I don't have to tell any of you, most of your adults here this morning, you know what your old habits of sin were. Do you still live in those? Are you still living in that? And if you are, then you need to examine yourself and your standing with Christ. If you're still living in that, this is really what Paul is getting down here, where where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. We are not to continue to put on the filthy rags of our old sins, but we are to wear the righteous clothing of salvation and righteousness. I've quoted Isaiah 61 and 10 there before that talks about wearing the garments of salvation and righteousness. This is what we are clothed in spiritually, but practically this is what we're supposed to look like or we're supposed to be doing here. I mean, to go back and live in these old this old clothing and these old rags of unrighteousness would be sort of like if we pull somebody in that's, that's destitute off the street and then we say, well, I'm going to give you a billion dollars and we're going to give you this brand new suit of clothes. He says, no, I think I'll just go back on the street. That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense either spiritually for somebody to say, I'm a Christian and I'm, I'm going to go back and I'm going to live the way that I want to. And I hear people say this. It's like they want to get by with the minimal amount of Christian living that they can. Well, as long as all it requires is just going to church on Sunday morning for an hour, I'm good. But don't affect my other hours of the week. That's not how it works. Christianity is a transformative thing transforms us. And so those who have learned Christ, have embraced the truth in concerning Christ, desire to put off the old sinful man. A desire to stay in sin or return to sin is an indication of still being in sin and not being saved. I hope there's nobody like that here this morning, that you profess Christ, but you're thinking, man, I sure wish I could go back and get drunk again. I sure wish I could go back and be sexually immoral again, curse again. If that's the mindset, then there's something wrong. So there's to be this desire as we've looked here and the spirit and, and, and as we've talked about, we all, we all understand what those sins are. One one passage I'll read, but there are sins that are outlined. God doesn't leave it 
You know, well, we have to guess about what sin is. Well, Paul writes over there in Galatians 5, 19 through 21. He says, if you are, he says, now the deeds of the flesh are evident. They are evident. There's no guesswork about this. Which are sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, things like these of which I forewarn you just as I forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. You make all the professions of faith that you want to, but if you're practicing this or these kind of sins, you're not going to heaven. Point blank. You're not going to heaven. We're not to continue in those sins. And let me say this. Any teaching which indicates that you can continue to live in those sins and call yourself a Christian, I'm going to tell you, those are false preachers. They're false preachers in that. So, he goes on here. In the latter part of verse 22 here. So he says, put, a full, uh, put aside this old man, and he says, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. Now the tense of the Greek verb here can, expresses a continuous or repeated action. In other words, there is constant corruption going on here. A corruption that will eventually destroy you eternally. You know, it's not that you just stay status quo in sin. You just get, keep getting more and more and more corrupt. It eats away at you. In other words, like a disease, like cancer. If you don't treat it, guess what? It doesn't get better. You've got to do something with it. You're going to get some kind of treatment for it. You're going to go get chemotherapy. You're going to get radiation. You've got to have surgery and all of those kind of things. And if you don't do something with that sin there... It's going, to, it's going to eat you away until it destroys you eternally. And let me say this, you can't fix it yourself. You can't just say, well, I'm going to pull myself up by the bootstraps and, and I'm going to clean up my language, you know. That sounds like a good old boy East Texas thing. I'm going to pull up my bootstraps. I'm going to, just, I'm going to clean up my language a little bit better. And I'm going to improve my manners. And I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. Guess what? You're just going to keep getting more corrupt. Because the problem is not on the outside. This is what the Pharisees wanted to do. You cannot uncorrupt yourselves. You cannot cure yourselves. Only Christ, through His redeeming grace and the work of the Spirit and the Gospel, can cure you of this corruption. The sinful man, the old man, because of being in darkness and alienated from the life of God and hardened in sin, cannot see the necessity of repentance from these things naturally. I've talked to people before. I'm, oh, I'm okay. I, I, I'm all right, you know. I remember one time, I'll share this, my wife told me this story about a roommate in college. And she, you know, we're talking about salvation. And talking about that, and she says, oh, she says, I'm okay. My, my parents took care of me when I was a baby. That took care of it. And believed in baptismal regeneration. In other words, that her parents baptized her in a church that believed that once you poured the water over the head, then they're, they're okay, they're saved. Oh, that's it. I'm good. No, you're not. <laughs> There's no outward sign that takes care of that inward need of that corruption. In that. But the sinful man, this old man, because of this darkness, and he's alienated, he doesn't see this, this thing naturally. God, let me say this, must turn the light on, spiritually speaking, and illuminate the sinner to what is going on. And I've quoted that verse before the God of this world has blinded the minds of those that believe not. And God is the only one who can open your eyes, turn the light on, and cure you of that corruption. But when that happens, men will repent and call on Christ for the cure. I believe that. I think about the Samaritan woman. I just read that passage from John 4 a little while ago. And Jesus is having this conversation with the Samaritan woman. You know, Jesus got criticized for 
going to sinners. Oh, look at him. He's consorting with sinners. Well, yeah, I've come to seek and to save that which was lost. And he said to her, and in the course of the conversation, he said, well, you've had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. Oops. <laughs> in that. The corruption just kept eating away and eating away and eating away. She didn't see her need of Christ, but I'll tell you this, before she left that, that well and left that water pot there, the light got turned on. And that corruption got cured. Her eyes were opened. The Philippian jailer, if you remember that, just a few little while before the earthquake happened, he was in there beating Paul and Silas. It was totally dark in that place. The earthquake comes. God calls him, I believe, and he runs to Paul and Silas. Of all the people for him to run to, he runs to Paul and Silas. What must I do to be saved? He got in the right place. God turned the light on. He saw his need. The world doesn't mind a Jesus that is just a moral Jesus, that just does good works. As recent ad campaigns, they don't mind a Jesus that just washes feet. But the Jesus that they have a problem with is the eternal Son of God, Jesus. The Lamb of God, Jesus. The resurrected Jesus. The coming again and righteous judge, Jesus. But He's the only Jesus. And this is the one that we have to come to for salvation. To be redeemed from this corruption. But He says, lay aside all of this and laying aside all of this now he says to be renewed in the spirit of your mind in verse 23 we've already talked about before our salvation our mind was depraved it was blind in fact we talked about there and that word in the greek meant insanity it was it was boiling and bubbling with the insanity of sin 1 Timothy 6, 5, Paul talks about these false teachers being men of depraved mind, deprived of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. They didn't follow Christ. They still don't follow Christ. We still have those around in our day that are saying, hey, godliness is gain. If you're godly or you become a Christian, all your problems will be solved and you'll have everything in the bank you want. You drive a brand new car, stuff your pockets full. They're saying, that's godliness. No, that's not godliness. They don't follow Christ. They don't believe the gospel because their minds are blinded. They're depraved and deprived of and from spiritual understanding. But now Paul, knowing that these Ephesian believers are indwelled and re-empowered by the Holy Spirit, as we know in Titus 3 and 5 through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, he commands them to be renewed in their mind. They are to be active in this renewing by the Holy Spirit. We've been renewed. We've been regenerated here. We receive this in salvation. Now we continue and we're to be imitators and obedient to the word. And our mind is to be more and more changed. Their minds are no longer, he's saying here to the Ephesians, they're no longer blind to the truth of God and Jesus Christ. Their minds are not depraved as they once were. They are no longer deprived of the truth of God's word. The light got turned on, he says, for you guys. You're no longer in this spiritual darkness. Now, Jesus has already said that those who are believers, that those who are evil hate the light. They won't come to the light. But he who does truth knows Christ. He comes to the light. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world in John 8 and 12. So who do those who are in the light, spiritually speaking, who do they want? Jesus. And they're going to go where the truth of Jesus is preached. Who Christ is. They say, I want light. I desire light. Please let me have more of that light. Let me see more of Christ. More of his glory. More of the truth of his word. Give me more and more and more and more. That should be our cry until our dying breath. 
till we go to glory and then we get to see the light that is there. It is an oxymoronic statement or a contradiction in terms for someone to say that they're still a Christian and still walking in darkness. It's a contradiction for somebody to say, I'm a Christian and they walk in darkness. It is. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6.14, what fellowship has light with darkness? Ephesians 5.8 says, for you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Now let me say, beloved, these are not requests. Paul is making imperative statements. They are commands. I've heard some say sometimes, well, my preacher or my Christian friends are telling me it's okay for me not to pursue a different walk. I have a casual Christianity. It's okay for me not to follow Christ too closely. Because, you know, they say, well, we're under grace, it'll be okay. You know what my, my word to you is? You need to get a new preacher. You need to get new friends if they're telling you that. Because that's not the truth. You say, whoo, Pastor Weber, you're being hard. You're being unloving. The most loving thing that I or any other Christian can do is to warn you that the path you're following is not the path of truth. This is God's breathed word. I was listening to something the other day, and it was talking about it was a good illustration, and people talking about these, these guys now that say, well, I've got a word from God. Let me tell you something. I would much rather believe the God-breathed, authoritative word of God that I know is the word of God than just somebody said that I got something. Paul told them these things. Why? Because he did love them. You know what the proof of Paul's love, I think better than any other verse that I've ever read, is it is in Romans 9 and 3 when he was talking about his heartbreak over ethnic Israel's rejection of Christ. He said, I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the faith. Let me tell you something. That's a lot of love. To say that I could wish... If it would, it, and he knew that God wasn't going to do this because he'd already given us Romans chapter 8. But he said, I could wish out of my love, my love for them, that I could have myself accursed so that they might know Christ. You want to talk about loving Jesus and loving souls? Let's hear anybody make that statement. How much do we love souls? How much do we love? This is Father's Day. Happy Father's Day, by the way, guys. I forgot to say that. How much do we love these little ones right here? Grandparents, how much do you love your grandchildren? Do you love them enough to pray for them every single day? If you're not, then don't talk about your love for Jesus and your love for them. Do that. You tell them the truth about Jesus. That's why I love family integrated churches. And I know there's probably some people thinking, oh, these kids in here, they're bothering me. They're not bothering me because they're hearing about Jesus. And we don't know how much they're getting. I don't care if they're three months old or how old they are. They're seeing mama and daddy in here. And they're hearing the songs of Zion be sung. And they're hearing people worship and praise God. And they're hearing the word of God being preached. And they're hearing about Jesus. And those 10 billion brain cells in there. Yeah, that's how many you got. Unless you, like me, you probably lost a few along the way. <laughs> but they're absorbing the word of God. And then one of these days, the Holy Spirit blesses our prayers and moves upon them and they're saved and then all of a sudden it starts absorbing the, the things of God in a whole new way. 
We're to be renewed in the spirit of our minds. This is what he's talking. We are, our minds, these minds that we have are to be enlightened by the spirit. They are to be made instruments of learning the things of God, the teachings, the precepts, the commandments of God. What was it that Colossians 3.16, Paul says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he does what? He meditates day and night. Acts 17 and 11, it says that the Bereans search the scriptures daily to see if these things are so. What I love to see is people that are hungry for God's word and we get out of church and you, you think that, that, that the, uh, whenever we get out it's not going to be 1215, we're past that. But we get, get to whenever and, and, and then we're still talking about the things of God and the word of God. It's because people are hungry for God's word. You know what that does for me after preaching 50 plus years? <laughs> I have longed for this. All my life. To see people that want to be in church and hear God's word. And they are hungry for God's word and they absorb. And as we absorb more and more of God's word in our minds, we are changed. We are transformed more and more into the image of Christ as we're predestined to do. As Romans 8 and 29 talks about, by the renewing of our minds, as Romans 12 and 2 talks about, we're becoming more Christ-minded, more Christ-thinking as we, as we do this. We are to apply our minds to the Word of God. You guys, we, we got, we've had all sorts of Laterno students through the years, and these guys are all brilliant as far as I can tell. Let me tell you, you don't get those degrees there at that university, I know, unless you apply your mind. <laughs> Some places you might skate by, but that's not going to be one of them. But if you're not going to become spiritually mature and be transformed by Christ unless you get into this book and use that brain that God has given you, that redeemed brain now that God has given you to learn the truth of Scripture. And trust me, you're not going to learn it all because I've been in it for a very long time and I feel like I've learned about a centimeter of it. And what Paul talks about in Romans 12 too that I already mentioned is that as we are doing this, we are proving, we are testing what the will of God is in regards to our decisions, our plans, our purposes, our wills, our decisions are to be informed and guided by God's word, by a scripture-saturated, Holy Spirit-saturated mind. In other words, our minds and our lives are no longer seeking our wills, but His will. We're no longer living our lives according to our wills, but His will. And we are no longer conformed to the world, but transformed. The life that is transformed is now being renewed constantly, is now preeminently concerned and focused upon God's kingdom and God's will. Is that what your mind is? Is that what your mind is? Are you conformed to that? Are you seeking and focused upon the kingdom of God and God's will? And then verse 24, and yes, I am going to finish this up. And to put on the new man, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. So as we are putting off the old man and renewed, and absorb more and more of the Word of God into our minds. We are putting on this new man. We're not just taking off the old, but we're putting on the new. So what Paul is saying is what is spiritually true is that as he says here, as he talks about here, that you are created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. We are holy in His sight for all eternity. We are if we believed in Christ. And then at this present time, we are to put on this righteousness and holiness practically. To do anything else, to strive for anything else, is a denial of what God has done for us. Simply Christ dying for our sins is to be our motivation for living our lives to the glory of God. The chief end of man 
is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Are you glorifying God with your life? Is your life transformed? Are you saturating your mind and your soul and your heart in the Word of God? If I am not putting on the new man, if I am not striving by the Spirit in accordance to the Word of God, then I am denying the work of salvation that Christ has done for me. If I am not doing this, If I'm not being obedient to this, then I'm denying that Christ has done anything for me, practically speaking. The word here for new is is completely new. Not a retread, not a renovation. It is a completely new man, a new creation in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things passed away or passed away. Behold, new things have come. We are a new man. And in this life we are to strive to put on outwardly this new man before others. Are you with every fiber of the strength that God has given you through the Holy Spirit striving to put on this new man? Well, I'm pretty far along in my Christian walk. I'm closer to the end than I am to the start. It doesn't matter. Are you still doing it to your last breath? Paul is saying here, don't hide the new man. Don't deny it, but make evident to others that you are a new creation in Christ. Be righteous. Be holy. In your home in your speech, in your work, in your marriage, in your relationship with others. May there be no doubt from others that are about you that you are putting on the new man. It's not just putting on a new leaf as somebody talks about or getting religion. What Paul is talking about here is that by the work of the Holy Spirit and by the word of God, we are putting off the old man. And because we love Christ, we are putting on the new man. Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Is that your sentiment? Is it? Is that your sentiment? Is that your desire here to say, yes, I've been crucified with Christ. I don't live. Christ Jesus lives in me. When we are putting off the old man, And putting on the new man, I'm giving evidence that Christ has been crucified for me and that I believe in Him by faith and say, yes, Jesus, I love you and I'm going to live like it. I'm going to be transformed. I want to be transformed by your Spirit and by the Word of God. Are you doing that? I hope, I pray that you are today. May we pray. Heavenly Father, forgive us of our shortfallings. Forgive me for my times in my life when I really wasn't striving to put off the old and put on the new. But Lord, I thank You that You've given us Your Holy Spirit. You've given us Your revealed Word and Your revealed will. You've given us new life. Heavenly Father, I pray that You'd bring us all under conviction.